cheer for Bruce Benson. Thank you. Um, background, I'm a professor of economics at Florida State University, uh, chairman of the economics department. I'm not a lawyer. A lot of people think I'm a lawyer because of what I write about. Um, uh, I've had lawyers tell me that uh, real lawyers couldn't write the things I write because they don't think in the same terms. Um, what I'm going to look at today is private law enforcement, as you can see. Um, and uh, the uh, focus will be on criminal justice. I do want to say that there's <coughs> a lot of other private law enforcement uh, around contract law. Um, you have business arbitration, those sorts of things. Uh, trade associations have their own arbitration tribunals. <coughs> Property law, uh, take a look at Robert Ellickson's book, if you haven't. Uh, Order Without Law, uh, uh, he looks actually at Shasta County, California, and the uh, <coughs> enforcement, or uh, let me say the resolution of disputes between neighbors in, in Shasta County. Um, the uh, issue of crime is a little different, of course, because we think of crime as not uh, a, a dispute or a issue between individuals, but an issue between individuals in the state. Uh, a little bit of quick background there. Um, if we inherited much of our law from England, of course, and if you go back uh, in, say, well, let's go back to pre-Norman England, uh, there was no crime. Uh, that doesn't mean these offenses we think of as crimes didn't exist. They just weren't defined as crimes. They were offenses against individuals, uh, and uh, <coughs> they were uh, <coughs> treated much like tort is today in the sense that individuals uh, would take people to court, prosecute, uh, in order to get compensation for the harms done uh, in, uh, at, because of the offense. So they were, there were lots of offenses against individuals and property. They just weren't crimes. Um, over time, especially after the Normans uh, invasion, you start getting a very strong uh, central government and uh, they're always looking for ways to raise money. Uh, they got involved in um, what's called the King's Peace, uh, which was an offense against the king and over time, they just expanded the concept of the king's peace so that uh, more and more uh, offenses were <coughs> considered to be against the king rather than against the individual who was a victim. Um, the f earliest we see the term crime or criminal act uh, in, the liter uh, in documentation is in the 12th century, I think, um, and the that term then referred to uh, an offense uh, it, for which the fine or payment goes to the king as opposed to an offense for which the crime or payment goes to the victim. Um, so it was a money-making operation for the kings initially. Um, the, uh, over time, of course, it became a money-losing operation, not for uh, those in power, for the taxpayer. Um, and I don't want to go into the long detail of why that occurred, but uh, the main uh, uh, reason, um, I think, goes back several centuries when uh, the kings expanded their concept of crime, uh, individuals no longer could uh, obtain compensation for uh, pursuit and prosecution of so-called criminals, um, their incentive to be involved was uh, weakened. There was no police force uh, to collect the fines then for the king, and so over time he tried to force people to uh, prosecute for him. They wouldn't do it. Uh, finally, uh, he, uh, they start collecting taxes and paying police. Um, so it's a long uh, history of gradual evolution to get where we are today, where now um, Modern criminal law is, is uh, highly pol politicized. Um, the, uh, I would say the dominant interest groups in political law probably now are the police and 
uh, a few, uh, few other organized labor, uh, criminal justice labor or <laughs> organizations like uh, prison guards and so on. Um, and uh, today we can think of crimes as, as uh, uh, mostly uh, offenses that are defined po uh, through politics. Um, all the old ones are still there, the, uh, the robbery and murder and all those sorts of things, but now we have lots of other offenses uh, that are victim have uh, no identifiable victim and so on. Um, so we've had a tremendous increase in criminalization over the centuries. Can you change the... Uh, so uh, how can we privatize this uh, mess that we've ended up with? Um, I want to uh, say that uh, I'm not talking about privatization the way um, a city official would. I'm not talking about contracting out with private uh, police by the government. Um, that's just extending the government and granting uh, coercive power to a, a private firm. Um, I'm talking about true privatization, both demand and supply uh, being privatized, and so that you get competition, um, and uh, competition is based, of course, on quality of services uh, rather than unfulfilled promises and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> well, it's happening. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, probably surprising uh, how much it's happening. Uh, the last figures I've seen, uh, which now are several years old, uh, was that there were about three times as many private security employees in the United States as there are public police. Um, the uh, one difference, of course, is that, uh, of course, the police describe all these private security people as mall cops, uh, people who want to be uh, police but can't make the grade, that sort of thing. Um, in fact, the good thing about the market is it pro provides what you want. So <clears throat> if you just want a night watchman or someone to walk around and, and uh, uh, give the uh, indication that you're, you might be watched and caught, um, you don't have to pay a very high wage for that person. Um, if a crime com is committed uh, after uh, any way, then that person has failed. Uh, he hasn't done his function. His job is not then to go pursue the criminals, just try to prevent the crime. Um, and that's another big difference, of course, between the public and the private. Uh, in uh, the area of law enforcement, private uh, firms that provide protection services are actually protecting. They're trying to prevent the crime from happening, whereas police, their incentives are to let the crime happen and then react afterwards by pursuing uh, the offender because, uh, like any bureaucracy, they have to have something to count uh, to show that they're important. And one of the main things they count is numbers of arrests and things like that. So the crime has to happen before they really uh, go into action by and large. Um, but again, uh, in the private sector, um, we have the minimum wage watchmen, but we also have uh, security specialists who earn um, you know, six-figure, seven-figure salaries because they're experts in uh, the technology of uh, crime prevention. Um, we, uh, we see, of course, lots of public police uh, who, after they retire with their high uh, pension benefits, uh, go into the private market as well to provide these kinds of services. Um, so there's a whole range of services being provided. I heard the term marketize used to differentiate it from privatize, which is just like contracting out. That's a, that's a nice term. I like that. I uh, haven't heard it, but I will use it now. <laughs> um, can you change the... Uh, um, okay, so what I want to uh, really argue for is not so much privatization, actually, as decriminalization. Um, I don't mean uh, just decriminalizing drugs, which, of course, I fully think should happen, but decriminalizing all the crimes, essentially 
turning them back into offenses against individuals uh, so that uh, the objective of the criminal justice system is no longer punishment of criminals, but restoration of victims. Uh, the, uh, thank you. Uh, the, the, per, uh, the whole idea of punishment, of course, developed because uh, the king was collecting all the, the money and, and people were unhappy. Uh, they weren't getting restored at all. Uh, so the king said, well, uh, essentially he said, uh, uh, I'll punish these people that co uh, committed the offense against you so you feel uh, like something has been done for you. Um, and so you see the development of imprisonment and capital punishment and all those sorts of things. Um, because the king had to do something to try to keep uh, the, the population reasonably content uh, when he was taking the money and they weren't getting compensated. Uh, I'm not going to add, I would not advocate compensation by taxpayers. That's just uh, adds to the problem. Uh, there are a lot of states that have moved in that direction. <clears throat> I think it's a mistake. The compensation should come from the offender, uh, not the taxpayer. Um, decriminalization is not legalization uh, in, in most areas. Um, it's uh, simply redefining uh, the offense to be one that has a victim and uh, where the victim, the objective of the process is to restore the victim, to uh, compensate the victim. Uh, so these are still illegal acts, they just have a different function. Um, I'm, I'm going relatively fast because uh, we're, I'm short of time. Um, the, uh, how do we go about achieving justice? Um, well, whether it's a private system uh, or a, pub, uh, a public system, uh, these offenses obviously have to be <coughs> uh, observed by someone, uh, reported uh, in some way so that uh, uh, a, if they occur, there will be then a, a string of, of following uh, actions. There ha will be an arrest um, if, if the person is apprehended. Um, <clears throat> the offender then has to be charged and prosecuted if he is apprehended. Uh, the prosecution has to be successful. Uh, some sentence, whether it's punishment or compensation, has to be handed down and then the sentence has to be carried out. So when I'm talking about privatizing, um, I'm talking about privatizing all of these. Uh, I will focus mainly <coughs> on police here, but uh, if you're interested, uh, I've got uh, a couple of books on this issue, uh, The Enterprise of Law back from 1990, and then more recently, uh, To Serve and Protect uh, Criminal uh, privatization and community in criminal justice. Uh, was there a question? Think about the incidents like uh, Ruby Ridge and Waco and Rodney King, where we've got you know, like it's public law enforcement. Um, you would think with private law enforcement having three times the number of characters involved, there would be a, a greater laundry list. Do you have any sort of uh, uh, incidents that show private security is dangerous or uh, unknown? Uh, well, it, I uh, recently had an editorial where I invited people to go online and look for uh, abuses, uh, illegal acts by private security and by public police and compare the numbers. Um, one person wrote back and said he couldn't find any by the private sector. Um, there, there are occasional abuses, of course. But one difference is that the private firm, as was suggested in the earlier talk, the private firm is liable for its actions. So uh, if the private firm abuses uh, an innocent victim or even a guilty party, uh, they can, <clears throat> they're subject to litigation and compensation. You, you can't sue the police. Uh, you can, but you're not going to win uh, most of the time because they don't have an obligation to protect, in fact. Yeah, may, may I suggest uh, one helpful way of analyzing the current system is to be able to differentiate between actual crimes and mere disobedience. Um, if, 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 if 
what you're being accused of is disobeying some bureaucrat, that's not a crime. Only if there's an actual victim, actual harm being done, then justice needs to be done. Uh, and, yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, if a police officer or a uh, private security officer commits harm in the process of pursuing justice, then that's a crime as well, uh, whereas it is not a crime in the, in the public sector policing system, unless it's just really egregious, of course, um, or caught on tape now. Uh, the, um, uh, so uh, these steps are required. Um, what I want to uh, quickly suggest is that if we were to switch the focus of our criminal justice system from punishment to restitution, um, we would ha improve every dimension, uh, every one of these areas, because the incentives would change. Um, today, uh, victimization surveys suggest that less than 40% of the victims of crimes actually report them. Uh, why report? They're not going to get solved anyway. 20% of the reported crimes are, are cleared by arrest. That doesn't mean that criminals are convicted or anything like that, just cleared by arrest. Um, so the odds of something happening are very small. You don't get uh, uh, compensated for uh, the uh, suffering you've already endured from the crime, and you don't get compensated for the time you spend and the effort you spend in working with the uh, criminal justice system to bring the person to justice either. Um, so uh, the incentives to report are very, very weak. Um, if, on the other hand, you expected to uh, get compensated for the, the crime that was committed against you, you'd have much stronger incentives to be involved in the process, much stronger incentives to report the crimes, uh, work with uh, a, some organization for pursuit and, and prosecution and that sort of thing. Um, Presumably, the, the compensation would include the, uh, the uh, compensation for the actual offense as well as the compensation for any costs you incur in, in, in pursuit and prosecution. Um, the, uh, the other uh, issue, of course, is uh, uh, that uh, private security uh, is relatively effective at crime prevention now. Um, there's a fair amount of evidence of that. Um, let's, uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, the, uh, I like these pictures. This guy's actually eating a donut. Um, uh, that guy, uh, the other one was at a DC rally by police a couple of years ago uh, where they were demanding more respect and, and benefits for the police. Um, uh, it's hard to uh, imagine that these guys are very good at pursuit either, uh, let alone protection. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, this is an alternative. Uh, this is a private firm. You can go to the website, uh, Critical Intervention Services. Uh, it's a Florida-based firm, Tampa, Florida. I'm from Florida, so um, I've had some interaction with this firm. Um, this firm, uh, it, its job is protection, prevention of offenses rather than response. Um, the individual who started it, very entrepreneurial individual, bought, borrowed a couple thousand dollars from his father to get things going and offered his protection services to low-income uh, <coughs> housing proprietors, landlords, saying, uh, you know, the police don't want to go in that uh, neighborhood, but we'll go in there and patrol and try to prevent uh, crimes from happening. Um, a couple landlords apparently took him up on it uh, uh, and found that uh, as a consequence, uh, their turnover rates fell dramatically, so they're a lot better off. Uh, the amount of vandalism and all those sorts of things that uh, raise costs for landlords fell. Uh, actually, crime reported crimes in those neighborhoods, uh, in those housing developments fell by uh, roughly 50%. Um, because these individuals not only patrol, but they also do lots of other things to try to uh, 
um, make the, uh, create a community uh, in these developments rather than simply having lots of people. Uh, they, <clears throat> so they, you can see some of the things they are engaged in. They always have a big Christmas uh, uh, program. Uh, they run programs for kids. Um, but they do patrol, and, and of course, this is what their officers look like down in the corner, not the police that were on the previous slide. Um, because he pays, he doesn't pay minimum wage, he pays a, a wage uh, that uh, will attract qualified people. He demands that they go through uh, various training programs and so on. Um, this firm now is uh, uh, expanded dramatically, um, providing these kinds of services. Uh, the low-income people who wouldn't ordinarily be able to hire private security um, are benefiting from this because uh, the landlords are benefiting from it and therefore uh, there have uh, uh, you reduce turnover and all those sorts of things because the people in those communities are better off. Uh, it doesn't mean crime disappears completely but uh, the uh, private sector uh, is much more effective at preventing crime uh, in general than the public sector. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, what about investigating? Uh, crimes do happen. <clears throat> How do we deal with them after the fact in, uh, with a private sector police force? Um, well, we already have private sector police forces uh, doing these sorts of things. Uh, one of the uh, probably most studied uh, examples is the railroad police in the United States. Uh, at the end of World War I, uh, the uh, railroads, you had to get permission from the government, of course, but the railroads uh, uh, established a uh, police force to deal with crimes uh, involving uh, rails, uh, robberies, uh, those sorts of things. Um, the uh, uh, effect was dramatic, uh, first uh, in part because the private sector police force does uh, try to watch and prevent the crimes, but in addition, uh, once the crime is committed, uh, they're much more effective at pursuing the offenders and uh, catching them and bringing them to justice. Um, the, uh, <coughs> this uh, police force still exists, uh, 1992 study, as you can see. Um, clearance rates adjusted for crime reporting um, are about, what, uh, three times uh, the level for the railroad police as they are for public police. Uh, next slide. Um, and so we start out with uh, cops, uh, look like cops with uniforms and badges and all of that, and with, uh, we still have them. Uh, with cars that look like police cars, uh, but they are not public employees. They are private, uh, private sector employees. Next. Um, so uh, we know that private uh, sector can provide these services. Um, how do we create uh, incentives for uh, them to do so? Um, now, of course, there, there are incentives to uh, pay private firms to, uh, to watch and protect, um, but uh, if we were to privatize the process, we'd have to look at pursuit as well. Um, well, uh, private right to restitution um, means that individuals, if it is a private right, it can be transferred. So. Um, you could go to, uh, say, an insurance company and uh, sign a contract that says, if I get robbed, you'll pay me, and now you have the right to go collect the money. Um, I talked about this a few years ago uh, at an audience that included uh, a number of people from insurance companies, and, and some of them were really excited about the idea. They thought, boy, uh, we would jump into this so fast. Uh, uh, because it's a, it's a way of um, expanding the insurance market for them, of course, but also um, uh, give, would give them the opportunity to actually pursue on their own. 
We do have insurance investigators and that sort of thing now, but it would be expanded uh, quite dramatically, I think, and fairly quickly. Um, we also, of course, have specialized firms already engaged in these, uh, these sorts of activities. Um, the the uh, most uh, noticeable probably in the United States uh, <coughs> are the is the bail bond uh, industry where uh, you have individuals uh, who pursue bail jumpers uh, and bring them back um, much more effectively than the public police do. Um, but uh, there's a long history of bounty hunters and, and uh, all sorts of specialized firms pursuing uh, criminals uh, uh, long before we had public police. Uh, bounty hunters have a bad name, of course, um, but um, uh, interestingly enough, when they, we start, first start seeing these kinds of thief takers or bounty hunters in England, uh, it was uh, to pursue people uh, for crimes, uh, and they were compensated by the victims who wanted uh, their goods returned or something like that. Uh, the government then started offering bounties, and once that, the government got involved, then you start getting all sorts of problems because uh, potent, uh, these individuals or some individuals would falsely accuse people uh, make up, uh, uh, make up uh, false evidence and all those sorts of things in order to collect the payment from the police or from the government, whereas uh, if you're collecting from a private individual, um, you're collecting because you've got the stuff that was stolen and got it back to them. Um, and uh, so the individual has, must be the one that stole it. Um, so uh, if we have uh, a system of restitution with transferable rights. David Friedman uh, is here who has talked about uh, this idea uh, quite a lot. Uh, then I think we would create strong incentives for the development of, of private pursuit uh, by um, organizations like uh, specialized bounty hunter firms, specialized uh, insurance arrangements, and so on. Uh, next slide. Um, what about prosecution? Um, you, you can hire a private prosecutor today uh, if you want to, um, uh, but they have to be approved by the, uh, the district attorney, uh, and usually all they can do is, is sort of watch and, and advise the district attorney to make sure they're doing uh, what they should be doing. Um, <clears throat> historically, the old private prosecution was w very common, widespread, um, and there are other countries where we see private prosecution uh, practiced as well, typically because uh, the uh, victim of the crime is uh, expecting to be compensated uh, in some way through prosecution, and so they're willing to hire private prosecutors. Uh, you're not going to see a whole lot of private prosecution unless uh, the victims uh, uh, are willing to pay them, and uh, that's unlikely when you uh, aren't going to benefit directly from the, uh, from the payments. Um, in the U.S., we do have some private uh, prosecution that uh, I think is very troubling, on the other hand. Um, called uh, private attorneys general, and we see them in, in environmental law. Uh, uh, the, uh, like the uh, Clean Water Act has a, uh, a fine specified in the Clean Water Act uh, for violations of um, terms of the Clean Water Act, uh, <clears throat> and these fines can be very large. Uh, somebody has, doesn't have the proper permit, uh, and they don't have it for several months, uh, they can be fined $25,000 a day for not having the, this proper permit. Um, so the environmental groups uh, have, uh, all of them have these legal branches now, uh, whose uh, one of their main functions is going out and trying to find people who are violating these kinds of uh, laws where um, 
they, uh, where there is a threat then of a public fine. And uh, of course, that threat alone leads many of the firms to negotiate a settlement. Uh, <clears throat> the settlement typically will include a payment to the environmental group uh, to cover their legal costs, uh, a uh, uh, payment, uh, usually in fact, uh, there's also a uh, supplemental environmental project that the firm agrees to fund so that they uh, end up spending, uh, the firms simply s spend a lot of money uh, to avoid paying even more fines. Uh, and so you get these settlements uh, because of this private uh, attorney's general opportunity for environmental groups. If it does go to court, they also get to collect their legal fees and those sorts of things, but uh, uh, most of them are settled. Uh, to me, of course, that's a bad idea because the, uh, it's the same as the bounty hunter issue. Um, if you uh, want to... Uh, if you, we, we have private individuals enforcing or prosecuting, uh, what, what was it, the difference you said between, um, uh, disobedience. yeah, enforcing disobedience, uh, then uh, we have uh, simply extended the coercive power of the government to uh, these private individuals, and they're really part of the government now instead of being truly private individuals. Uh, so this is like contracting out. Uh, it's a, it's a, not a good thing, but if we had private prosecutors being employed by the victims so it, it is truly a market uh, rather than contracting, um, I think we would see a lot of that occurring as well. <clears throat> Today, of course, most convictions uh, of criminals are through plea bargaining. It's a bargain between the, uh, uh, well, really between the criminal's lawyer uh, and the uh, attorney general. Um, it's, uh, or public prosecutor, there's, there's, uh, the, the pot prosecutor could consult with the victim in making the bargain, but, uh, by and large, there's no reason to. Um, and what they typically do, of course, is, is <clears throat> downgrade the offense, uh, in exchange for an admission of guilty, uh, or reduce the number of offenses in exchange for admissions of, of, uh, of guilt for some of them, uh, reduce the time that's going to have to be served in prison in exchange for a, a, a admission of guilt. Um, all of these things, of course, reduce the consequences for the criminal um, and are therefore um, le going to be less satisfactory for the actual victim. Uh, I would say we would still see lots of bargaining in a private sector, uh, but it would be between the victim or his representative and the offender. So the bargain is not about how much punishment you get, but how, how big the fine's going to be or the compensation's going to be. Um, and uh, so you're going to have the, the victim's interest recognized immediately. Um, how to, in, in Japan, we see something like this on a largely informal basis. Um, if someone commits an offense and uh, <clears throat> the victim knows who it is or <clears throat> somebody else observes it and, and the individual knows he's going to get caught, uh, he will send a representative, a member of his family or something like that, to the uh, victim and say, <clears throat> I'm really sorry I did this, I, 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 want, I want to ask for your forgiveness, um, what can I do to make things right? And they'll bargain, uh, and maybe for some compensation of some sort, um, then if, the, uh, if this bargain is successful, <clears throat> the victim writes a letter to the public prosecutor saying, uh, the offender is remorseful, uh, he, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, come to a, a, an agreement that's satisfactory for me, uh, and so the public prosecution itself will uh, uh, produce a very light punishment, if, if any punishment at all. Um, and, uh, of course, going to prison in Japan is not pleasant, but uh, 
uh, if you don't uh, bargain, you're going to get a much heavier uh, punishment from the government. So there is uh, examples of victim uh, offender bargaining now, um, but uh, with a, uh, an explicit recognition that what we're after is victim compensation, uh, rather than punishment, I think uh, we would see a lot more of that sort of thing. Um, we raised the issue of police abuse. Uh, the, uh, here you can see the cop reaching out and trying to take away the signs about uh, uh, the uh, police abuse at a public meeting. Um, the uh, incentives here would be very different as well, of course, as I said before in answering a question uh, the private sector would be much uh, uh, more uh, careful, I would say, because they are liable uh, typically for the actions of their employees. And so if you hire somebody who's a bully, uh, you're probably going to have to uh, start paying people uh, for the actions of that bully. Uh, your incentives then are to hire people who aren't bullies. Uh, and uh, that typically is the case. Question? Yeah, you know, um, I'd love you to do how to address the problem of, and which I think happens a lot in society often, where a person who is in the judgment uh, commits an uh, offense against a person who is say, these other person very much injured, a lot of expense, and all that, was completely injured. Uh, how do you get the money out of it? insurance? Well, insurance is one way. Um, the insurance company then <clears throat> may not be able to collect, of course, but uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about private courts. Uh, there are uh, experimental private uh, mediation arrangements for minor crimes going on now. Uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, private arbitration and mediation, which mainly focus on uh, determining what, has, what should be paid in compensation. Uh, if, it, if we were after victim compensation, these private courts could uh, easily handle that sort of thing. Um, uh, they're not deciding to hang somebody, they're just deciding what uh, the payment should be. So uh, it's uh, uh, a, a, a clearly something that could occur. Let's go to the next slide um, and we get to this issue of collecting the restitution. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, of course, a, a always a troubling issue, Do we use, uh, are we going to use coercion to collect the restitution? Um, I, uh, historically in these sorts of uh, private compensation systems, uh, there has been the ability to threaten ostracism, to throw the person out uh, if he doesn't pay. Uh, there certainly are examples where if the person doesn't pay, he is punished physically. Uh, so there are those kinds of things that have occurred. Um, uh, my uh, hope would be that uh, what we would see is, of course, the individuals who are in a position to pay, uh, the offenders would pay. Uh, those who may not be in a position to pay uh, would have a uh, would have an opportunity to work the debt off that uh, if you don't think they're going to uh, renege and flee then uh, maybe they just work the job they have um, if uh, you think they're going to flee then part of the bargain will be uh, a an agreement on the part of the offender to subject himself to certain amounts of uh, uh, what, uh, constraint? Um, uh, we all write contracts that constrain our behavior, and, and uh, we can do that in this case too. Question? Well, I just want to make an observation that this, this discussion is taking place in a world where we're all under the crushing burden of the state. You know, half of our income and all of our substance is being eaten away in a world of a free market. Indigents, I mean, it, you couldn't find an indigent if you wanted to. I mean, there would be so much prosperity with such a few number of years that these issues would be completely immutable. And it was, the, the market forces for good behavior, for treating people fairly, uh, would just cause people to act in a way that, you know, the numbers of conflicts that would require this kind of restitution would be vanishingly small, and insurance companies. 
The losses incurred by an indigent would be trivial. Um, yeah. That's just the way I see it. Well, I think, I think you're right. Uh, if, if we were to implement this, particularly if we were also to implement all the other things people have been talking about uh, here, um, then the amount of crime would be sub uh, substantially lower. Um, the need for any of this would be substantially lower. Uh, should there be a need, uh, then uh, uh, people uh, who wanted to come to America but couldn't afford it would sign indentured service uh, contracts to come to America and agree to work for somebody for a, a period of time. Um, those were, um, uh, some were abused, no doubt, but uh, uh, in, in the world of today where uh, every action is possibly being filmed by somebody's cell phone, uh, those kinds of abuses are uh, much less likely uh, when the uh, abuser is going to be liable for his, uh, the action. Uh, not maybe when they're not liable. See, another thing is that a lot of people are on this. Their bonding is required for them to be in a certain place. And I think that's the way that anybody who wants to step foot on certain property uh, to have access to possible commit a crime, they have to be bonded first. Um, the, uh, if if we had uh, the private roads that I talked about uh, earlier, rather than uh, public roads where people have free access, um, then uh, I would say most crimes, uh, ind ind indigents wouldn't f <laughs> be able to find a place to, uh, to be uh, if they're observed on a private road and they can't explain uh, their uh, reason for being there, they can be told to leave. Um, so. Um, again, uh, how big an indigent problem there would be is, is unclear, uh, but certainly some people are going to refuse to pay or try to refuse to pay, um, and um, so uh, some sort of private collection market uh, would uh, develop. I, um, we have, can we change the slide? Uh, uh, we have lots of examples now of, of private industry uh, or private uh, production in uh, prisons. Uh, there are various states are experimenting with private uh, uh, with uh, prison work programs. Uh, one of the interesting ones uh, was actually developed within the uh, uh, main prison where uh, an, uh, individuals uh, started producing various uh, crafts for the uh, s uh, prison store uh, and the warden at the time uh, thought that was a good idea, you know, idle hands and all of that sort of stuff. So he encouraged this to develop um, and uh, the, the, it turned out uh, some of these people were pretty entrepreneurial. They uh, created firms that uh, pr produced lots of uh, these sorts of things, um, hired other prisoners to work for them, and uh, so you end up with a, a prison, a voluntary prison industry program that uh, uh, actually uh, was in fact uh, uh, beneficial for uh, the uh, guards because uh, the prison, uh, the entrepreneurs didn't want their uh, activities disrupted by violence and all that sort of stuff in the prison, so they, uh, they helped suppress uh, any threats to uh, prison uh, industries themselves. Um, the uh, idea that uh, individuals are not willing to work if they're in prison simply is not true. Uh, even the uh, voluntary private industry programs that are, are around the country usually have way more volunteers than uh, they have positions. Uh, so uh, the uh, potential for some sort of uh, prison uh, voluntary arrangement is certainly possible. Yeah. David? As you know, I suggested to many of these quite a long time ago, there are two problems with the shift from punishment to restitution that I've been missing, one is fairly serious. Uh, the first is that if I expect to be compensated when I report my crime, that increases my incentive to report it, but decreases my incentive to prevent it. So that if 
think about the fact that a crime really depends both on decisions by the potential victim and by the criminal, my incentive to take precautions is that it can be confiscated. That's a the more serious problem, though, is that all of this is assuming, in effect, an honest and uncorrupt court system. And a different way of putting it is that when you shift to the restitution model, you're setting up a situation where I can get sufficient control over the court, I can expropriate your human capital by convicting you of something you didn't do and then making you, in effect, a temporary slave. It also means that I've got the incentive to convict not the person who committed the crime, but the deepest pockets I can find with that enough right amount of cash to have, have, have an indentured service. That after all, we do have a restitution system already on a very large scale called court law. And we are familiar with some of these problems that we observed. Yes, but we have public courts. <laughs> I understand. The farms. But to be applicable, as you know, I'm in favor of the full scale version. And I'd like to suggest that there are real advantages to private deterrence rather than compensation as the incentive for court. Because if the reason you want to catch people is so people won't commit crimes against them, you want to catch the right guy. The reason is you can extract money from them in compensation, then you want to catch something you can predict. And according to how good the court system is, that may or may not fall in the So I'm always saying there are, there are problems that are most solutions. There are problems raised by the people you require to take them And that's why I'm always uh, uh, unwilling to actually, or I, I am now, I used to uh, be willing to describe a private system. Um, Today, I, I'm much less specific because um, I realize that entrepreneurs are so much more clever than I am at coming up with ideas to deal with these kinds of problems uh, that uh, if I were to predict something um, that uh, I, I, it probably wouldn't arise. It, it, some things would, uh, but for the most part, uh, uh, you know, they're going to, uh, we have mechanisms, for instance, for choosing arbitrators that give, uh, uh, that uh, require that both parties have to agree to the choice. Um, ra anytime you have, as you suggest, a uh, one party getting to choose the courts, you've got problems. Uh, so if you have to have agreement on the arbitrator or mediator uh, by both parties, then the uh, potential for that is reduced. Um, you have to have some end to that uh, debate about who should be the judge, of course, but, uh, but there are a lot of uh, different ways that the private sector has worked out to uh, create that possibility. Um, so, yeah, uh, market isn't perfect. Um, neither is government. Uh, I think the uh, potential for market uh, imperfections are real but much smaller than the imperfections we get out of government and furthermore the incentives to find solutions to those uh, those inefficiencies or imperfections uh, are much stronger in a private market system than they are in a bureaucratic system so um, I'm not trying to suggest this would be perfect um, I think uh, it would evolve and get better over time in the private sector then, uh, and it's evolving over time in the public sector to get worse, as far as I can tell. Um, next slide. The, the main point then is uh, uh, privatization, I think, means by both demand, demand and a supply. Uh, do I think this is gonna happen in uh, my lifetime? No. Uh, do I think that uh, it, uh, can never happen. Well, we're already we already see every aspect of this process being privatized. Um, so uh, we're seeing the trends um, in, as uh, things are moving into the private sector. As I said, uh, in 1970 there were uh, roughly the same number of private security and public police. Now there's three times as many private security as public police. Um, most contracts now with consumers have uh, arbitration clauses in them. In 1970, they didn't. Uh, all sorts of things are moving in the direction of privatization. Um, and uh, so 
whether the government wants it to happen or not, it is happening, uh, and uh, hopefully it will continue to undermine the effectiveness of the public sector. Thank you.